Hello everyone, it's Migs here again and I want to welcome you to a special edition video. This one's been in the making for a while now. My motivation for this project was to make a larger wheel for my truck that could house all the buttons I needed and which could resemble a classic wooden wheel as found in the Ferraris and Astons of a bygone era. This is not the usual modding type video, but one that I think will grab your attention because, as I'm sure, many of you have grappled with the idea of having a modified type of sim wheel which can accommodate your actual game's interactive requirements in a hands-on style setup and something that could handle a multitude of buttons on one wheel and in a format that can work on any vehicle sim game. Yes, I know there are many videos of DIY button boxes out there, but I'm talking about something really unique in its application. Something that could change the way you interact with how you experience your gaming, and believe me, I've built my own share of button boxes. Some with gaming controllers and others with Arduinos, etc. The problem with this is, almost all the DIY videos on YouTube and the likes focus either on using an Arduino board, which then requires all types of resistors and some sketch code to work. Which, if you're that way inclined, it's not a bad thing, but still has various limitations. Apps like Auto Hotkey and Lua Macros are also viable options, but come with incredible amounts of education, especially if it's the first time you encounter these. It can be a bit overwhelming. Ultimately, I never really got to enjoy them as I planned, the button boxes I built. And I approached this project with the average DIY guy's mentality, so I kept it simple. I must be very clear here, this video is not a blueprint for the next best thing, but merely an alternate option of what you can make it be, your way. The bonus is that you could do this in your own space with minimal costs if you wish, and it's so versatile that it could be applied to virtually any application that requires a sim wheel to operate. Speaking of which, the version I'm about to show you only cost me around $30. Seriously, I really only made use of items that I had lying around the house and old obsolete PC paraphernalia. This version makes use of a wireless keyboard and mouse combo, coupled to an original Logitech GT Pro as the base, and if you have the time and patience to make it, I can guarantee you that this would be one of the more rewarding projects you'll ever undertake. So buckle up, because here we go. In the comments below, you'll find the links to all the needed files to complete this project, which include all the templates for the version we're about to create. I've included 3D print files in two formats for those of you who can afford to have the parts printed. But like I said before, this video is for those that want to make a proper, personalized and special wheel using only what you have for a fraction of the price. So the parts you'll need are an old keyboard and mouse, preferably a wireless combo, but if you don't have that, you could also use a wired combo too. 48 push button switches, the only parts I bought for this project. Uh, micro switches and lever switches, which I scavenged from old PC mice I had lying around. Ethernet or network cable. These normally come with eight colored single strand wires, which is perfect for this application. If you don't have that, get yourself the thinnest gauge wire you can find. It will be useful when soldering it to the board. 16 millimeter MDF board. Stay away from the chipboard as that will ruin the finish. 1 meter by 1 meter will be more than sufficient. 8 or 10 mil plywood. It's what I had available for the button holders. 6 millimeter hardboard, or in my case, only a 3 millimeter, which I glued the rough sides together to get to the 6 mil. Uh, 6 millimeter wood dowels, that's optional. Battery cradle, or if you don't have one, you can make one from your old keyboard or your mouse casing. Clear sticky tape. Crafters paper glue or glue stick, sandpaper in different grits, wood glue, soldering wire, silver paint, wood varnish, and various screws, bolts and nuts, springs and simple fridge magnets. Basically what I could find and make work. So the tools you'll be needing, drill or drill press, a jigsaw, a hole saw, yeah you can choose the diameter that works best for you. A router, a bullnose router bit, the larger the better. Screwdrivers, hammer, wood files, center punch, a soldering iron, and a multimeter. It's optional, but it's highly recommended. Step one is working with the templates. So first of all, you're gonna print the PDF templates in actual size. Don't shrink or fit to page on your printer as this will change the aspect ratio and wheel dimensions. 
Once they're printed, cut off the excess and try to stick the pages together with clear sticky tape as true as possible. Remember that you're going to use these to transfer the template onto the wood for cutting. If you can print them at your local print shop in actual size, it's even better. So paste the templates onto the wood sections designated for the various components using a paper glue stick or glue that can be easily removed once the templates have been cut out. The button holders are 8 to 10 millimeter plywood or what you have. Don't use the chipboard. The housing back, you're going to need one of 6 millimeter hardboard. For the housing case, you'll need 16 millimeter MDF. You'll need one of those. For the housing case, 6 millimeter hardboard will be used. You'll need one. And the housing inner, you're going to need 16 millimeter MDF. You'll need one of those. The hub cover, you'll need one of those and that's uh, basically from 8 or 10 mil plywood or what you have uh, again don't use the chipboard hub button I use the 16 millimeter MDF that was used for the horn button and the paddles I use the 6 millimeter hardboard there will be six of those the wheel frame also use 6 millimeter hardboard that's one of those and the wheel rim back that's 16 millimeter MDF one of those and the wheel rim front is 16 millimeter MDF you'll also need one of those. In this step we'll be working and focusing on the wheel rim. Cut out all the templates leaving a little margin from the cut line. You can profile these to perfection later. I cut the housing inner from the wheel rim back as it became apparent that the router bit was not going to reach all the way into the smaller curves. Because the blade removed some material, I just made filler pieces and glued them onto the wheel rim so that everything could fit properly later. For the wheel frame, don't cut out the button hole patterns. These are just there for alignment of the actual button holders that will eventually be glued to the wheel frame later. Once you have all the parts cut out, join the wheel frame, the wheel rim back and the wheel rim front by drilling 8 concentric holes into the combo. Then screw these parts all together so you can align, sand and smooth out any imperfections. Do not glue these together. Once you're happy with the profiled finish, disassemble these and using a router with a bullnose bit, work the outer face edges of each wheel rim to resemble an actual wheel rim. Do not router the wheel frame. In step 3, we'll be using the wheel housing components already cut. Glue the 16mm MDF housing inner to the 6mm hardboard housing case to the 16mm MDF housing case in this exact order. Once the glue is dried, profile, sand and smooth out any imperfections until you're happy with the result. Now assemble the whole wheel as shown in the picture and check for imperfections. This is the time to make sure that the finish on the wheel is to your liking. To secure the wheel housing to the wheel rim back, I drilled two screws on each inner side of the housing as shown in the picture. The next step is making the button holders. As in the picture, using a center punch, find the centers of each hole and punch a guide to drill each hole out according to the dimensions of your push button switches so that it looks like this. Step 5 sees us making the hub cover and horn. After cutting and profiling the hub cover, I decided to take this wheel to another level and seeing as I didn't have any type of switch resembling a horn assembly, I decided to make one. I cut an oversized rounded backing plate from 3mm hardboard that could serve as the horn base and glued it to the back of the hub cover. Drilling 7 holes as depicted in the picture, the four silver screws are sleeved with four soft springs that are screwed into the horn button from behind. Adjusting these screws gave me the perfect alignment and feel for the horn. The center hole is where I mounted the micro switch and I screwed a small screw into the center of the horn button from behind to give me adjustment for the switch when depressing. The black screws are just to secure the switch in place using a piece of PVC as backing. Like I said, whatever I could get my hands on. In step 6, we're going to be making the paddles. These were a little tricky, as my original design was to have them 3D printed. 
But in retrospect, I'm glad I went the DIY route. The pictures aren't really detailed here and I built these by feel and what I was trying to accomplish, so bear with me. Each paddle has a designation and this has got to do with the fact that I wanted to use this wheel not only for my truck but for the other racing or sim racing applications I have as well. The top paddles are obviously for sequential shifting in sim racing, the middle paddles are used for my truck's indicators and the lower paddles for my truck's retarder. The frame holding the paddle set is normal 16 by 2.5 millimeter flat aluminium bar which was bent and drilled to hold the three paddles snugly, which in turn was mounted to the housing back by two screws for each paddle set. From this picture, you can see what I used to space and bolt everything together. I used M4 threaded bar as the paddles are 6mm in thickness, but again, use what you got. On the ends of each paddle, I attached magnets, which I scavenged from old seeding light fixtures and they worked very well. Fridge magnets would have the same eff effect except that you'd have to drill and glue these in place. Same result, just a different approach. On the magnet side of each paddle, I placed a screw into each paddle so that it could protrude through a corresponding hole in the housing back that would act as the push rod that would trigger the lever arch micro switch located on the inside of the housing back. For extra kick, I located a spring for each pedal to help with the positive kickback feel I was trying to achieve. As for the lever switch mounts, I used 2mm brazing rods which slid perfectly into each switch, placed three switches according to the layout of the pedals and fastened them down with a couple of washers and wood screws. Simple enough. In step 7, we'll focus on making the wheel mount hub adapter. Yeah, you'll need to improvise because this is where every wheel will differ. You need to take your actual wheel base mount and profile an exact but negative copy of it. This unfortunately is crucial as it, if it's not done properly, you could have excessive movement or play in your wheel, which will defy the purpose of this project entirely. So make sure it has a snug fit. Once you have your hub profiled, Cut a 16mm MDF circle as large as your housing back will accommodate and this is to ensure that once glued you'll have a solid base to attach to. For extra strength I added 4 wood screws and an M8 bolt and nut as shown in this picture. In this next step it's time to give your wheel some color. Because I chose to go with a classic looking wheel a good quality marine varnish is what I used and to contrast I used an aluminium bitumen quick drying paint for the wheel frame and paddles. But you can use your own creativity to achieve whatever you fancy. On a previous wheel I built I also used carbon fiber vinyl which works well and came out awesome as it's still in the perfect condition considering it's over 7 years old. Judge for yourself. In step 9 we decipher your keyboard's PCB controller. Open your keyboard by removing all the screws which hold it together and remove the controller board carefully. Using a sheet of paper, number the controller terminals from left to right. Remove the plastic foils on the inside of the keyboard and place them on the table one being the negative side and the other being the positive side of each representative key. Each foil has dots representing each key's location on the keyboard that traces back to one of the terminals on that respective foil. This is where it gets a bit tricky if you don't have a multimeter because you'll have to physically trace each dot and line to its exit terminal point which will frankly cause you many issues. You will get cross-eyed and you'll end up with a faulty matrix. Using your multimeter, hold one probe on a dot, for example, let's choose the escape key, and using the other probe, touch each terminal exit of that same foil until you get a continuity signal or active connection. It is possible that you'll get more than one key sharing a specific terminal. Once you know that escape responds to terminal 7 on that foil, for example, write down on that sheet that you numbered earlier, 7 equals escape. 
You'll have to do this for every single dot on each foil, numbering as you go along. Once you've completed your matrix, find which terminals on the PCB controller activate, for example, the letter A. So if terminal 3 on foil 1 and terminal 17 on foil 2 both reflect the letter A, then you have made that connection. An easy way to check your work is to use this virtual keyboard emulator listed in the link below. Connect your PC board controller to your PC and run the app. Get a piece of wire about 10 cm long and using the ends, touch terminals 3 and 17. If the key highlights on the screen, then you know you have the correct bindings for this key. Do this until you have all the keys allocated and that is how you'll have your wiring matrix prepared for your wiring of your buttons. At this point, I'd like to caution you as to which keys you should not use, especially if you're doing this for Euro Truck Simulator. Avoid all the function keys, so F1 to F12. Also avoid the numeric pad number keys, so 0 to 9 on the numpad, as well as the key 0 on the keyboard, as these controls your teleporting functions of the game. And finally, don't use special keys uh, such as Tab, Shift, Control, Alt, Enter, Windows key, Calculator key, and any media keys. They just won't work. By adhering to these rules, you should get around 60 key functions depending on the type of keyboard you have. Believe me, it's more than enough. The next step sees us preparing the keyboard controller. Frankly, this was the most challenging part of the build, not because it was difficult, but because it took me several attempts and several keyboards to get it right. Okay, so keyboard number one, total chaos. Being a fairly modern keyboard, the carbon-like material located on the board's contacts was impossible to solder to, even after carefully scraping and sanding it down to bare metal, the solder just wouldn't stick to it. So I tried making an adapter using PVC and copper wire that would sit on top of it to try and make contact, but that was also hit and miss at best. Then I tried drilling 1mm holes into each contact point on that board, but that just made the contact surface even less manageable, which really made me consider tanking this project. Ultimately, my perseverance and several old keyboards later, I discovered that the older the keyboard, the easier the contacts were to solder to. So the moral of the story is, try to get the oldest type of keyboard you can get. But you still have to carefully remove the layer over each contact to get to the bare metal. But older keyboards have a larger or rather broader contact point for each pin. So this makes it far easier to manage. You still have to however be very gentle when soldering the wires onto the contacts. In step 11, we assemble the controller and wire up the buttons. Eventually though, this is what mine looks like. Using the network cable wires, I cut them into 10 cm pieces and arrange them in color sequence. Knowing what I know now, I suggest cutting them into 20 cm strips and no less. It makes it much easier to manage and solder once you're making the connections. After soldering the wires onto, onto the keyboard controller, I added a piece of PVC that I slotted with a hacksaw blade in the same orientation as the keyboard controller's contacts. This prevented any wires from touching one another, seeing as the solder heat melted some of the wires' sleeves. The PVC also helps in keeping the wires from moving on the board and makes it less likely to develop any failures later on. I added two screws to secure the PVC plate onto the board and then folded all the wires over onto it. Next, I secured the original steel plate that held the keyboard PCB controller in place in the keyboard housing over the folded wires. This, I believe, is a crucial and effective way of securing the wires to withstand any force feedback or rotary vibrations when you're using the wheel. From there on, it was just a matter of wiring every button according to your matrix and testing it against the virtual keyboard. I did, however, designate each button its own keyboard key and wrote these inside the housing for easy reference. If you're using a wireless version, the last thing was to drill a small hole through the housing back to feed the power wires through to house the battery cradle which I simply secured with two small screws. Once that's done, 
simply screw on the housing back and attach the wheel to your sim base. No need to connect wires or plugs, just simple plug and play. Step 12. Configuring the key bindings. Finally, all that's left to do is go into your game's controller configuration and reconfigure every key according to your preference. Take your truck for a drive and test out all the buttons and see if they feel like they're in the right place. If you're happy with the layout, I have an extra treat for you. Simply print out the decal template from the link below and have it printed at your local print shop in vinyl stickers. But if you want to save a few extra bucks, print this file on a normal color printer and then stick some sticky tape over each decal. Cut out these decals and stick them onto your buttons with some quality glue and you'll be surprised at how good it really looks. Not only will it outlast any printed vinyl, it could possibly outlast your wheel. From these pictures, you can see how well mine finally came out, and I'm honestly really satisfied with the added immersion this wheel has brought to my driving experience. I really hope it brings you the same enjoyment. On a final note, if you can afford the 3D printed version, then that is what you should go with. It will just be so much simpler and a lot quicker to make, not to mention the weight saving. My wood version comes in at just under 2 kilos. The wood version however, if you're into making something with your bare hands and enjoy the challenges, this is the way to go honestly. It is a lot of work, but it's good work. And because it's heavier, it gave me a different feeling, a weighted feeling, which positively exaggerates the force feedback that and the fact that you know your wheel inside and out. I hope you guys enjoyed this video and let me know how it goes with your own versions. Thank you for watching and I'll catch you on the next one.